Hello, and welcome to this talk on quantum economics and finance. Quantum economics and finance uses quantum mathematics to model phenomena including cognition, financial transactions, and the dynamics of money and credit. And we'll be talking about topics including why quantum in the first place, quantum probability and logic, basics of quantum computing, quantum cognition, the quantum walk, quantum game theory, quantum supply and demand, threshold effects, option pricing, and the money bomb. So why quantum in the first place? Quantum revolution in physics was born when physicists found that at the subatomic level energy was always exchanged in terms of discrete parcels, which they called quanta from the Latin for how much. In economics, the equivalent is financial transactions, like when you buy an ice cream in Italy and you say quanto costa, which makes the quantum connection a little clearer. So money behaves in some ways like an object, but not a classical one. It shows signature properties of quantum systems such as discreteness, indeterminacy, entanglement, duality, interference, and so on. Perhaps the most obvious such property is the way that money jumps. Uh, in, in physics, Erwin Schrodinger said, if we have to go on with these damned quantum jumps, then I'm sorry that I ever got involved. And with uh, financial transactions, of course, the same thing happens all the time, like when you tap your car to the store, the money doesn't flow out continuously, it just jumps. In physics, the uh, position of a particle is fundamentally indeterminate and is in a sense constructed by the measurement procedure. It's the same thing in markets. Uh, if you push your house up for sale, you will have a fuzzy idea of the price, but uh, the actual monetary value is only determined at the moment of the sale. And this is money's job. It's a way to collapse value down to number. Um, we often talk about money, but one thing that isn't often emphasized is just the most basic feature, which is, is its connection with numbers. So if you look at a U.S. dollar bill, for example, you see it says uh, one, a numerical one, and a word one in each corner. So it's got quite a few ones, and then it's got uh, one dollar down at the bottom and a big one in the middle, and there's a lot more ones on the other side. So they're really emphasizing the connection with one, and that is money's most basic property, that it combines the properties of an owned thing with a number. The, these dual properties are reflected in the two main historical theories of money, which are bullionism, so money is gold and nothing else, as J.P. Morgan said, and chartalism, which is the idea that credit alone is money, as Alfred Mitchell had said in the next year. But then Bitcoin comes along, and on the one hand, it seems to be completely virtual, but on the other hand, it's also real, as you'll uh, notice if you happen to lose the hard drive in which your Bitcoins are located. And the duality of money, therefore, uh, is similar to the duality of light. So wave-particle complementarity has been reflected in theories of light, go back millennia, uh, so Aristotle thought light was a wave, and Newton thought it was uh, uh, particles, and, and it sort of bounced back and forth until finally um, the quantum theory came along and showed that it has properties of both at the same time. It's the same with money. Um, in, in economics, we're used to treating preferences as, as sort of fixed and known objects with some cognitive biases, but often our preferences are made up in response to questions which act like a kind of a measurement event. So thoughts and ideas behave in some ways like objects, but they're not classical objects. In physics, Bohr's theory of wave-particle complementarity was actually inspired by the observation from psychologists that we can hold opposite ideas in the mind at the same time, in, in superposition. And uh, in fact, it's these interference terms which uh, play a very ro important role in quantum cognition, as we'll see. In physics, particles can mysteriously become entangled, so they act as a single system. And in the financial system, we'll see a much more direct form of entanglement, where financial assets and virtual liabilities have these quantum characteristics of entanglement. In economics, uh, there's this idea of rational economic man is kind of like a robot. The picture which is emerging from quantum social science is of a quantum economic person who is entangled, indeterminate, dynamic, paradoxical, and alive. As the philosopher Slavoj Žižek said, a fact rarely notice is that you know, quantum physics appears to defy our common sense view of material reality, but it seems to apply somewhat better to 
uh, the, the sort of human reality where the human spirit encounters itself outside itself. Okay, so pop quiz. What is quantum economics? Is it A, about discoveries that economists have made by studying tiny, tiny amounts of money? No. B, about the idea that by attuning ourselves with an evolving economic consciousness field, we can both get in touch with the universe and become rich? No, unfortunately. C, physics envy taken to its logical conclusion. Well, no, there, there is a danger of that, but as we'll see, the rest of these talks uh, really don't touch on physics very much at all. Or D, about the idea that the money system has quantum properties of its own, such as indeterminacy, duality, interference, and entanglement, which scale up and affect the economy as a whole. And the correct answer is, of course, D.